Well, right now, Dan Lanning and Kylo Ren, Circa The Last Jedi, a terrible movie, by the way, have something in common. I'll tell you what that is. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked on Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. If you haven't already, please like, comment, subscribe wherever you listen to or watch this show. If you want to drop a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, those help as well. So why is Dan Lanning like Kylo Ren? There's this iconic gif in The Last Jedi, which I feel obliged to repeat, is not a good movie, where Kylo Ren thinks he is instructing Imperial walkers to fire blasters at Luke Skywalker. It's actually just a hologram projection. I didn't hate the scene overall, but there's this iconic gif where Kylo Ren is just yelling, more, more. Well, that's Dan Lanning with transfers right now. More, more, more. And I'm here for it, man. I'm absolutely here for it. And I think that both of the transfers who we're talking about on today's show, and then we only have about 50 other things to get to on the pod today, but we will do our best to get through all of them. He's looking for depth and not just body filler depth. He's looking for competitive depth, right? The tight end, Ludwig, I mentioned on yesterday's show, looks like it's a little bit more of, uh, I mean, he's a preferred walk on, or at least that was the the report. Let's say that's the case. That's a little bit more of eh, like just add depth, have you know a guy there that you feel could could play in a pinch if needed, but you're not expecting a ton out of him. Not necessarily the case with these two transfer portal additions. So, first guy we got to talk about is Nico Reed, who had a couple interceptions for the Buffs last year. Started all 12 games. He was one of the few starters that you know, had some interest at least, was a three-star recruit when he he went to Colorado, 5'10", 160 pounds, class of 2021, has the tie to Demetrius Martin. Now, I know that everyone is going to automatically jump to a callback that is Christian Gonzalez. Last time we took a corner from Colorado that Demetrius Martin knew and had recruited to Boulder at one point in time, it ended up being one of the best corners Oregon's had, maybe the best individual corner Oregon's had in the last five to 10 years. He was uh, sensational, taken number 17 overall by the New England Patriots, of course. But I don't think that we should have those sorts of expectations for Nico Reed. And if you go back to the shows I I had leading up to uh, this past season, I was pretty high on Gonzalez, who had been Pac-12 honorable mention uh, the year prior at Colorado, had improved dramatically from year one to year two, looked like he could take another step, and he most definitely did, turning himself into the number two corner in uh, the, the 2023 NFL draft. I don't think Nico Reed has those sorts of expectations, but Dan Lanning and Demetrius Martin would not just be bringing this guy in for for kicks, right? They're not doing this for fun. I think they're bringing in Nico Reed for competitive depth because they're trying to get the most like with the Kyrie Jackson addition, I think as well, who I don't believe is locked into a starting corner position. They are looking to get the most out of the players that they have in that room. And to do so, they're going to bring in guys who can push each other. Now, this could also be a philosophical play, right? In terms of the personnel that Oregon wants to have on the field at any point in time, they might want to run more, you know, three corner sets. Heck, they might want to run four corner sets. You, You never know, right? Because currently with the addition of Nico Reed, who, you know, was a power five starter a year ago, had a couple picks was a sub-60 grade in PFF, which is not a a tell-all and whatnot, but is a a testament to what I was kind of talking about of being careful comparing him to Gonzo. I don't expect him to become an all-conference caliber player here, but could he see the field in a meaningful way? Absolutely, as we'll talk about in a moment. He actually had a really, really high run grade, just under 70, which is pretty darn good for a corner. But the corner back room, not defensive back room, we're not looking at safeties here, We're not looking at Tysheem Johnson. We're not looking at Evan Williams. We're not looking at Steve Stevens. We're not looking at Brian Addison. Okay, we're not looking at those guys. The cornerback room now has these players. Nico Reed, 
Jaleel Florence, Dante Manning, Triquez Bridges, Kamari Terrell, Kyrie Jackson, Cole Martin, Solomon Davis, Davis, and then Dalen Austin and Roderick Pleasant. They arrive in the fall as true freshmen. That, <clears throat> excuse me, that was almost a really bad cough. That's 10 total cornerbacks on the roster. In 2022, you had four cornerbacks that saw at least 200 snaps, which is kind of the, the benchmark defensively for you know what I see as meaningful playing time. Because when I say all these four names, Dante Manning, Christian Gonzalez, Triquez Bridges, and Angelo Florence, those were all guys that we saw on the field in meaningful action when the game was still, you know, it, it, up in the air, within balance, or any however you want to phrase it. Like they were playing essentially starters or heavy rotation snaps. So, a couple of takeaways here to Nico Reed. Yes, it's a competitive depth piece. I don't know exactly where he slots in because you have some talented guys in that room. You have experienced guys in that room. I mean, Dante Manning is entering his fourth year of college football. Triquez Bridges, I think, is entering his third or fourth. Can't remember exactly which. I think it's third. Jaleel Florence is entering year two, and he looked really, really good as a true freshman. And then you have other guys in there like Kyrie Jackson, who played at Alabama. Cole Martin looked really good in the spring game. I mean, really good in the spring game. And then you have two talented freshmen coming in the fall. So that's 10 total cornerbacks. So Oregon's more than set at this position. But I, I think one of the other takeaways, in addition to the competitive depth component, is Dalen Austin and Roderick Pleasant, who haven't had spring football, I think they're going to struggle to see the field at the cornerback position, right? Special teams are an option. Maybe they play a factor in their return game, especially Roderick Pleasant. We've talked about that before here, here on the show. But I think those two, and maybe even Cole Martin, who, I mean, he looked just so, so ready. I don't know how he doesn't see the field. But I don't know how you bring in a guy who is a Power 5 starter. I know it was for a dreadful Power 5 team a year ago but he was one of their better players. They clearly see something that they like. And I don't know why you bring this guy in after spring practice. If you don't think he's going to at least be a contributor in some form or fashion. So th this now feels honestly like an all out position. Battle. I don't think a number one corner in mind, a number two corner in mind, a number three, or even a number four. I don't think that's set. I think it's all pretty up in the air. I'm sure they have some idea, but I don't think you bring in a guy like Nico Reed unless you thought he could compete for a spot on the depth chart. So I think it's going to be tough for those true freshmen, uh, Martin, Austin, and Pleasant, to see the field because they're just going up against so much experience. Like, I know Cole Martin looked really good in a handful of snaps in the spring game. I am so high on what his career could be. I mean, he stepped right in against a guy entering his fourth year of college football in Chris Hudson, who's been productive, and he was putting the clamps down. I mean, he was really really good and he was so so fast but I don't know how the true freshman could just suddenly leapfrog guys who have played three and four years of college football I think that's a tough thing even for talented true freshmen to do and I don't think they'd be bringing in this corner if they felt that they you know had guys that they were completely and utterly dead set on as being you know, uh, capable of bringing them the level of football they want to see in the secondary uh, come this fall. So there's the inevitable question to ask with the addition of Nico Reed to the cornerback room, the one that's on everybody's mind, the one that is on one of your minds specifically, but I bet countless others as well. That question may seem obvious to some. It may not seem obvious to others. What is obvious is that built bars are fantastic because they're a delicious snack without all the sugar and calories. See, I got you on that one. I got you pretty good. I, I don't know. I sometimes they get delivered better than others. That was a pretty good one. I'm going to toot my own horn just a bit right there, but I don't need to toot the horn of built bars too hard. I'm going to because they're great. And if you haven't bought your next order, you should. They're healthy. They taste amazing. They're covered in 100% real chocolate. You can go to your local Walmart, go get a box of four in the pharmacy section. You can get a 13-bar box at Sam's Club, or you can go to Built.com, get specialty flavors. If you go to Sam's Club, you can get 13-bar boxes with hit flavors, brownie batter puff and churro puff, both are amazing. You know, I'm a mint brownie guy for those of you everydayers out there who listen. So again, Walmart, Sam's Club, Built.com, go get your next order of Built Bars covered in that 100% yummy, delicious, real chocolate, high protein, low sugar. Do so. You can thank me later. All sorts of rolling today. 
I mean, seriously, we are. At, I mean, this is as jam packed of a show. I had a whole other idea, and then we added Nico Reed, and so that brings us to this question. And part of the at Smalls underscore fifty five or at Locked On Ducks. Those are the Twitter handles, DMs, and mentions wide open. You can also hop in the YouTube comments. I monitor those daily. Gabe, his first ever question, by the way. Welcome to the mailbag. For the mailbag, Gabe says, with the addition of Nico Reed and two straight years of treating Colorado like our quarterback, cornerback farm system, nice, does this potentially open the door for moving Triquez Bridges permanently to his best position, safety? Triquez, Evan, and Taishim at the three safety spots with Kyrie and the winner of Nico, Dante, and Jalil at the two corner spots seems like a solid defensive backfield. Don't leave out Brian Addison, by the way. Brian Addison is an explosive athlete was probably our best playmaker outside of Gonzo in the secondary last year. Had several interceptions. I, I love the way he plays. He's fast, instinctual, explosive, grades well in coverage on PFF. So I wouldn't leave him out. But, again, having more depth there is not the uh, the worst thing in the world. So this is the question everyone is inevitably going to ask. Do you bring in a corner because you're going to move Triquez over to safety? Short answer, I could see it, but I can't guarantee it. The reason that I can see it is because – the names that I just listed in there, you have 10 cornerbacks. They also just moved a guy out of the safety room in Jamal Hill. So in theory, from a depth chart standpoint, you have a spot where guys could rotate in, where guys could see the field in a meaningful way. Now, Triquez was Oregon's second highest graded coverage player in 2022. Would I take that with his length? at the back end of Oregon's defense and an ability to play man coverage? Yeah, I absolutely would. Now, the question would be, which safety slot do they want to put him in and how do they want to move those pieces around? Because they brought in Taishim Johnson for a reason. He looked great in the spring game, by the way, and he's a nickel safety. They brought in Evan Williams for a reason. They moved Jamal Hill out for a reason. They still have Brian Addison back there. And as I talked about, I really like Brian Addison. So if you want to add a fourth high caliber safety to that room. I could see it. You know, Steve Stevens is a veteran safety. I don't think he's made a ton of impact plays. And, you know, the, the PFF grades reflect that, that he's been just like a solid contributing player, but certainly passable on, on the depth chart, in my view. I could see Triquiz Bridges being the fourth safety in that room. The question would be, where do you want to put him? Do you want to put him at free safety? Do you want to put him at strong safety? Do you want to put him at nickel safety? He's six foot three. He's on the skinnier side. I think he could be strong or I, frankly, I think he's a guy who could play across the board because he's got that sort of size and that athleticism and of course, great length. But I don't think this is necessarily a guarantee because we saw with Gary Bryant Jr. coming in to the wide receiver room. Was that indicative that Kyler Casper was going to move to tight end or Treshawn Holden was going to move to tight end? No, like you, you saw a depth chart. You had sufficient depth, and they added another piece to it. And I think that this move is very similar in that sense. And I think it's bringing competitive depth to a position group that can certainly be improved from what they were a year ago. And maybe the Jamal Hill move down to linebackers opening up Triquez to go back to safety. And look, it could end up being a great thing for Triquez Bridges if that's the case, because I think his coverage skills have improved. They have to when you're playing corner because you're doing a lot more individual man-to-man -man coverage stuff. And then if you go back to safety where you're more comfortable anyway, and that was his position coming out of high school, and he, he really, really shined at that spot when uh, when he was down in, in the state of Alabama. I think it was Pinson uh, around there, but he was really good. They moved him to corner. Maybe he is better suited to play at the safety position. But then you have this game of musical chairs. Again, depth, competitive balance, not a bad thing. But it's hard to see how safeties get moved out of their positions to me than it is to see corners getting moved because Dante Manning, we've all been waiting for him to pop. I'm not getting my hopes up on that front. I would love to see it, but we haven't seen it yet. Kyrie Jackson didn't wow me in the spring game was, you know, viewed by Nick Saban as someone who he wanted to come play. That says something. But is he really locked into a starting spot? I think the Nico Reed edition says eh, may, maybe not on that front. And then you've got Jalil Florence, who showed, I thought, a ton of upside as a true freshman, but has room to grow. How much can you grow in year two? Like One thing I think for certain 
that we all just should be aware of is these 10 cornerbacks for eligibility and transfer purposes are probably going to have like six at most still on the roster come 2024. Like I, I think maybe you could see seven, but you just have so many guys in there with talent and, and eligibility remaining. I, I, I'm hard pressed to see. I don't have an inclination as to who that's going to be, but that's another thing I thought when I was getting ready for today's show. I'm like, you got 10 corners in there. That's a lot of guys. Dante Manning has a year after this one. Could see him being a grad transfer if he gets moved down the depth chart. If Jalil Florence doesn't take a step forward, I could see him going elsewhere because I think he's a really talented guy. I'm not wishing that to happen. I'm just saying that's a reality of the situation, but that's the reality of the world of college football now is you can always find talented guys for one reason or another leaving other power five schools. And I, I think you're going to have an insane corner competition now. And, you know, it, it might drive some guys out, but at the end of the day, is that the worst thing in the world? Probably not. Cause it's a good problem to have. Like you might say, Oh, I want those guys to stick around. I want those guys to stick around too. And I hope they all do. But if some of them leave, that just means there are other guys that are playing at a high level they don't think they can uh, they can beat on the field. So I don't think it's an automatic, but you definitely cannot rule it out because the the depth at safety is not as is not as strong as it is at corner. And with the Jamal Hill move, I could see them moving those those sorts of chess pieces around. Speaking of competitive depth, Nishad Strother, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, is coming to Oregon to play on the interior of the offensive line, including the starting rotation at this point in time, where he did not grade particularly well against the pass over there playing for the Pirates, but had a run block grade on PFF over 72, which is more than solid. The benchmark there is just, you know, for reference, over 70, good, over 80, great, over 90, NFL caliber stuff, all conference player. Like that's that's kind of your, your your benchmark there. If you're over 65, like I, if you're over 60, you're you know starting solid caliber player, but uh, nothing special. So I'm curious as to why they they felt Strother needed to come in. I, I wonder. I, I I do wonder if the junior Angolau injury is a factor here. If this is an insurance policy of sorts that they feel they have someone who could step in if Angolau doesn't get back from the injury, or maybe he's not recovering the way that, uh, that, that they wanted him to. I would just monitor that. That was the first thought I had was you're bringing in a guard. You already brought in a guard. You already brought back several guards from, from last year's team, Marcus Harper, Stephen Jones, Jackson Powers, Johnson, JPJ, of course, expected to slide over to center and junior Angolau. Plus you've got Davey Uli in there. Who's you know done pretty well in the playing time he's seen so far. I, I, I would watch that. He started 13 games at left guard a season ago, uh, 30 starts overall in 34 career games. So he, he's an experienced guy on the interior of the offensive line. And he's got a guards bill. He's about six foot three and, and, and over 300 pounds. But that, that, that was the thought that I had. Um, it, it could be a, an instance of, look, we want to be able to go two and three deep comfortably along the offensive line at every position could very well be that that is, that is, entirely possible but I, I i do wonder if if it's a function of they went through spring football junior angle out didn't play marcus harper also didn't play i wonder if one of those injuries which of course we you know shouldn't expect to hear a whole heck, a whole heck of a lot of information about dan lanny and company understandably so i've been very tight-lipped with that stuff uh for the last uh year and a half or so in, in eugene not expecting that to change but monitor that going forward. That's kind of my only takeaway there on uh, the, the Strother edition. I don't think he automatically slots in as a starter. He could just be a, a depth piece, but it just begs the question, like, what, why, right? Like, I think you bring in Nico Reed because you feel like your cornerback room needs a push, needs another body, or you want to put more of them on the field at any point in time, or you want to slide TriQuest over to safety, right? Like, all this stuff happens for a purpose. All this stuff happens for for a reason so i would uh i would be wary of uh of such information going forward so continuing on 
still got three more questions to get to today. We're going to get through them. Don't worry. This one from Bud Everts, regular question asker and an everyday are here on the pod. Appreciate you, Bud. How would you suggest changing non-conference football scheduling to a new model similar to basketball in the near future, given contracted games in the 2030s? I would absolutely cut bait with the games that are scheduled five, six, seven, eight, 12 years in advance. I would get rid of that model entirely. This is going to be a really quick answer to your question here, Bud. And I would allow for a schedule to be formed in the non-conference slate on a year-to-year basis. Now, the expanded version of my answer will include details on why I uh, why I believe this, and maybe I can address it another time on on the pod. But like I said, we got a lot to get lot to get to on today's show. But there need to be requirements. There needs to be some sort of central governing body or requirements from uh, the college football playoff committee that say you cannot make the playoff if you do not at least schedule another power five opponent who had a winning record at, at least, or, you know, you, you can speculate every way to Sunday and twice on Tuesday about how many different parameters you want to institute there, but schools should not have the ability to set up their schedule to make it easier. Everybody should play nine conference games. Everybody should have a power five opponent on their schedule and teams should be rewarded and schools should be rewarded for scheduling one or two games of high caliber, right? So Georgia and BYU, BYU was ranked 12th at the time that we played them. They ended up being an eight and five football team, really solid game. Didn't have to do that. In addition to Georgia could have done it the way they did this year right? Where it's Texas Tech, solid power five school on the road. Then you've got Hawaii and Portland State should be cupcake games, but you should be rewarded in more ways than one for scheduling those sorts of games, but you need to take the power away from the individual schools, or you can do what Ohio State did to Washington, cancel the home and home. What Michigan did to UCLA, cancel the home and home and go schedule an easy game instead. Scheduling is the most fundamentally broken part of college football in my view it is not the four-team playoff it is not nil it is scheduling it is an absolute major problem and i could go so much longer on 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 this sort of stuff but i have other matters i want to get to but it needs to be a year to year endeavor it would also allow for g5 schools to build a playoff caliber resume more easily because they could schedule a school from the year before who, if, you, if you're able to beat them, gives you the institutional respect you need in the eyes of the committee to get a top seed, right? And that gets easier now in the 12-team playoff format, but that needs to happen. There have to be rules and there have to be restrictions or, or punishments or downgrades or whatever for teams like Michigan that go out there and schedule – you know, UConn, Hawaii, and Middle Tennessee, or whatever their non-conference schedule was the last couple of years. That should never, ever be allowed. Nobody wins in this scenario, except those individual schools. But that's the whole point, is you shouldn't be able to rig it in your own favor like that. Michigan is playing three joke games in their non-conference this year. Utah is playing Florida and Baylor. You can argue that's a mistake on Utah's part, but I think they should be rewarded, and that's better for us as fans. Do it on a year-to-year basis. Set it up with distinct parameters so that everybody's got to play a high-level opponent at least once in the non-conference slate. They can play more if they'd like to. Okay, that's my scheduling rant. And I am going to repeat that ad nauseum until something changes on that front. Uh, This from Aaron Long. This is kind of a quick question. Uh, Wants to explain, can you explain this nonsense is what he said. U of O, University of Oregon, U of W, University of Washington, U of F, University of Florida, OU, University of Oklahoma, CU, University of Colorado, KU, University of Kansas. Uh, This was just kind of like a quick aside that I'm happy to cover, by the way, because I know why this is the case. Uh, there, There are a multitude of factors here, but in essence, every school in the college sports realm, specifically in football, has got to have their own abbreviation, has to be unique. So Kansas is KU, even though they're the University of Kansas, because Kentucky is UK. And people don't want to have that sort of stuff confused. Oklahoma and Oregon, somebody's got to be the other way around because you need to have a way 
so that it's easier for fans and media to distinguish when they see the logo, like we all know, UO, Oregon, OU, Oklahoma, right? Even though it's listed as the University of Oklahoma. Colorado's the most interesting one on here. They are CU instead of UC so that they are not confused with a school being in the UC system, right? There's an entire network of schools of universities in the state of California, UC LA, by the way, UC Berkeley, UC, I think there's a San Francisco, UC Santa Barbara, UC Davis, UC San Diego. Those schools are all tied together. They all start with UC and Colorado isn't a part of that and they don't want to be lumped in with that. So they are instead CU. So every time you see one of those, you know, two letter abbreviations for a school and you're like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. That's the reason is there is another school that already has that abbreviation. And so they don't want to be, you know, crossing lines and whatnot. It's, it, it, it's highly logical in my view. And that's kind of the uh, explanation for it, but love, love that, uh, that question. I was scrolling through the YouTube comments the other day. I saw that and I was like, Oh, I got, I got 90 seconds on the show tomorrow. I'll put that in the rundown. Uh, I've also got time for this one. Last one of the day here from Tanya mailbag question. Can you give us a look under the hood by telling us a little about how you study the ducks? Obviously, you're very knowledgeable. Thank you. I try. But between your job and the podcast, I assume she's referring to my play by play uh, job with Southern Utah University. How much time do you spend watching games, rewatching games, researching and everything else that goes into your prep? So a lot of my ability to just talk right for however long this episode ends up being is rooted in my my sports broadcasting background of sports talk radio, right? So I got into podcasting because I'd done sports talk radio before. And when you do sports talk radio, I did it in college. I did it at my last job. I've done some national sports talk radio uh, for, for a company called Sports Map. So when you do that, you, you develop an understanding in your own process because everybody is unique for how to talk about something for more than just you know, 60 seconds, right? Like to, to start today's show, Nico Reed, the number of different angles I came at that, what it means for Oregon, how it affects the room, where he slots in and everything like that. Those sorts of processes come naturally to me now, but those are muscles that I've kind of developed mentally over the last several years, having been a sports broadcaster and, you know, play by play helps as well. Cause I posit questions to my analyst thoughts about a player insights and everything like that. But doing sports talk radio is kind of where that that comes from. Right. And having a take, having an opinion, flushing things out, how to communicate that opinion. Right. And and I'm not that different, frankly, than th than a lot of you out there. So I've grown up an Oregon fan my entire life. I've grown up a big sports fan my entire life. So a lot of my opinions and, and preconceived notions about the sporting world and individual events and how I see this playing out, how I think that'll go and everything like that. That just comes from my time having watched sports nonstop, be it, you know, football, basketball, baseball, golf, soccer, everything from the time that I was a really, really little kid. So all my observations, all the information, all the conversations I've ever had with, with fans, with my parents, with my brother, with my friends, everybody, all of that plays into, you know, how I react to sports news, right? So when, you know, Mario Cristobal announces that, that he's leaving, a lot of different ways that you can attack that, uh, th that particular segment, right? And I did so here on the show. That was right around the time that I, uh, I relaunched the show and started hosting in December of, of 2021. Or, you know, I remember one of the early takes I had was on Bo Nix. And a lot of people are saying, oh, I don't want Bo Nix. I don't want to transfer and whatnot. And, this is just kind of how my brain functions at this point, because, you know, I do two podcasts and a daily radio show now uh, that I've been doing for the last several months. So this is just how my brain like my brain is just always thinking like at some level, everybody truly I'm an absolute maniac. Like I'm, I'm not even kidding. Like when it comes to broadcasting and my career, which I love more than anything, I'm an absolute maniac with this sort of stuff. I am constantly thinking about information, opinions, takes segment ideas. I mean, it'll, you know, thoughts will come to me, whether it's in the, the the shower, on the golf course, in conversation with friends, I'll hear a take on another show and say, oh, no, I don't agree with that. I see how he got that conclusion, but I don't agree with it. That's just how my brain has always really been hardwired. So a lot of that comes from, you know, all those years and, and many months of, of just kind of doing that sort of stuff over and over and over again, in terms of daily prep on the show, you know, off-season shows 
take me longer than in-season shows because in-season shows, there's a structure, right? For that 13, 14 week stretch where we've got games, you know, it's Monday, biggest takeaways from the show, maybe Tuesday, individuals who stood out Wednesday, maybe talk a little recruit and maybe talk big picture college football playoff and such Thursday. What does Oregon need to do better? Or what did they do well last week that you want to carry over Friday full on game preview and so on. Right. So there's a structure to it now in the off season. And it was actually full disclosure, my biggest like concern when I got to locked on and, and heard that like, oh, yeah, no, it's daily podcasts. I'm like, man, what am I going to talk about every day? And I used to like really stress about that kind of stuff. I'd write stuff down and put all these. And I still do like I, I still put, you know, I have a running note sheet of uh on, on a Google Doc where I'm just writing stuff down all the time. Anytime a thought pops into my head for, you know, Oregon. The, the, the Ducks podcast, of course, the Pac-12 podcast, my radio show, I just go in there and I just write it down. And then basically each day I plan out what the show is going to be. And I and I altered, like I mentioned, today's show for what the news actually ended up being, which was Nico Reed. Right. I had an entirely different rundown. I moved that to, to Thursday's show because I've got a, a recruiting guy. Our new recruiting expert at the at the Locked On Network is going to be making his inaugural appearance here on Locked On Ducks on on tomorrow's show. So a lot of that stuff in terms of planning each and every show is done day or day, day before, right? The day that that I record, I tend to wait to record my shows. Sometimes, you know, depending on my schedule, it's easier to record in the morning. But because of days like today, if I'd recorded at ten in the morning. I would have missed the Nico Reed news and then I'm a day late on it. Right. And that's kind of the fine line you have to walk in podcasting. It's flexible. You can do what you want, but you also have to, you know, be as relevant and current as, as you can. And every day is out there know that there have been times where I've recorded a show and then news is broke, but my schedule being what it is, sometimes it's really, really lax in the summer. Cause I don't have play by play to do right now. I just got my podcasts and, and my radio shows so I can you know work from anywhere. Hence coming to you live from sisters, Oregon, as we speak, so that sort of stuff gets done on a day-to-day basis. In terms of how long it takes, completely depends, right? And, and by the way, part of my part of my prep as well is uh, I don't know if you wanted to hear all this sort of stuff, but you know, you ask, you're gonna you're gonna get an honest answer, right? We all know that's kind of how I how I roll on here, and I don't know how to how to do it any other way. So when uh, when mailbag questions come in, right? Those go on my note sheet as well. So then when I'm going through a rundown, right? I might have one particular topic like the Nico Reed and uh, I already forgot the other guy's name, the Nishad Strother announcements. Like those are concrete pieces of news. But then for the rest of the show, I'm going to go through the mailbag and see, you know, which questions have been in there the longest and which ones are most relevant to what I'm talking about right now. And then I'll kind of fill in the show that way think about my answers, develop takes and and all that sort of stuff. And then I come on here and I I record the show on my laptop and I've got uh, some equipment to try and make me look as nice as possible. Uh, I of course have a a, a stage light on, on my laptop. Uh, I've got my, my Yeti microphone. I've got a webcam as well. So they look a little bit clearer and, and crisper and, you know, try to give you the best, most professional looking and sounding show possible. Then once I hit, you know, end recording, I download the video file, download the audio file, splice it together with the intro for the podcast and then upload it to YouTube. And I've got a description in there and I've got haters and whatnot, everything for, for the show. And, you know, overall, it, it depends um, if you're looking for like an exact time of how long a show takes to do. It depends on how how busy of a news day it is. Like, honestly, that that is a straight up honest answer. All in all, with you know keeping tabs on on the information, recording the show, formulating segments, prepping, and everything like that, uploading and scheduling everything to go out, it could take anywhere from you know, forty five minutes to an hour and a half to two hours. Like it really, really depends because you know sometimes the news is slower, so I have to think about okay, what am I going to talk about? What's an interesting take? What's a player? What's a position group? What's a you know angle of the team or you know a key for the season that I haven't really discussed at this point in time? So all all that kind of factors into it. So uh, there's your five or six minute, I think that was like a seven minute uh, peek behind the curtain and such. But I, I love that you asked that question, and and I love that you all asked the questions. I, I really, really do. I remember when I started the show, you know, in December of 2021. 
And, you know, I remember texting, uh, remember texting a friend of mine, uh, who's, who's an Oregon fan, went to Oregon. Um, I remember texting her like, Hey, my, I got my first podcast episode that got 200 downloads. And I thought that was just like, so awesome. It's like, Oh man, that's great. And now I look at the numbers that the show does and the number of questions I get, the volume of questions I get. I mean, I've got a bunch of questions still sitting in the mailbag. Right. And I'm just trying to chip away at them, you know, show by show. And it wasn't always like that. And you all make my job easier. You make it more fun as well. And I think you help me as a podcaster with the, the questions that you send in because it gives me an idea of what's on your mind, what you want to talk about so that I can, you know, best cater the show to what you you are all thinking. So I, I think that uh, that wraps up that that response was probably a little longer even than, than I was planning for. But uh, great question. Great questions, plural. Keep them coming. As always, again, Twitter at Smalls underscore 55 or at Locked on Ducks. You can also drop a YouTube comment. I appreciate everyone listening so very, very much. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.